Good morning, Bethlehem. Good morning. It's just so good that we can come together once again here in the parking lot where we come to worship God and give him the honor, the praise, and all of the glory. It's been a long time since we've been together. But God has still been good to us. Yes, so our scripture this morning will come from the book of John, chapter 21, starting at verse 15 and reading to verse 17. When they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? The third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? As I said, you know, it's been a trying time. For the last year, we've been going through trials and tribulations. There are some that we have lost along the way. But God has blessed us together here in this place. Once again, we come together as a church family. So this morning, I would say that be encouraged because God is still on the throne. Let us pray. Eternal and all wise God, our Father. Once again, Lord, we are blessed to have the privilege to come before you, Lord. For you encourage us to come and cast our cares upon you. Oh, Father God, we just come to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of another day. Thank you, Lord, that you woke us up early this morning. Yes. Thank you, Lord. And started us on our way. The blood was still running warm in our veins. And we had a reasonable portion of health and strength. We thank you, Lord, that through it all, through it all, Lord, you've been a good God. A God who has watched over us. A God who sits high but looks low. Know all about our troubles. Father God, we just come to him and say thank you. And Father, as I begin to pray this prayer, Lord, I can't help but think about our pastor, Dr. David. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I ask you, Lord, that your blessing be upon him and his family. Yeah. That you will heal his body, Lord, that he may return to his flock. And Father God, we just want to believe, Father God, that you can and that you will. Dear yeah, Father God, I ask today that you will bless all of those who are gathered here in this time. Father God, I pray that we will not lose hope. I pray, Father God, that we'll continue to practice love among one another. And though we may have been apart for some time, Lord, that we have never forgotten one another. And we'll pray for one another, Lord. Oh, Father, I know that there have been many nights when Mama and Daddy has cried, Lord. There have been many days when people have looked through the windows when they could no longer touch their loved ones. And Father God, there have been many who say standing in the food line, those who were in need, those who are looking for help, Lord. And we just ask, Father God, that if, if we just help somebody as we travel along the way, then our living will not be in vain. So, Father God, we ask this morning that you will strengthen us. Strengthen us, Lord, to do your will. And Father God, help us to go where you tell us to go. To do what you tell us to do, Lord. Lord, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of standing here. Thank you, Lord, that you have made it through. Thank you, Lord, for my family, my friends, my church family, for all that you've done for me. In your name, Lord, be all the glory, all the honor, and all of the praise. For it's in the name of Jesus that I pray.
Father, I pray for this offering that people are about to give back to you. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless it. Oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you just use it in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Oh, Bethlehem, I tell you, it's a great day. It's a wonderful day. It's a blessed day. We called on the Lord and he answered our prayers. Thank you, Lord, for this day that we are gathered here to just worship with praise and thanksgiving. We called on the Lord. 
Let no one say that the Lord does not answer prayer because he does. So we just thank him. Thank him for another day. And this morning as we prepare to hear this word, let us just lift up our voices with response and all that we hear because it is a word from God. Amen? Amen. All right. Our scripture will be coming from John 21, 15 through 17. And thank you, uh, Deacon Gillis, for reading it and sharing it with us as we wait patiently await to hear this word. But thank you, church, for being here, for just being here and gathered here, feel of a spirit of listening and doing. So as we prepare to hear this word, let us let us pray. Amen. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for bringing us together this day to worship you and to praise you. Because, Lord, this is a day that you have made. Prepare us to be listeners and doers. Prepare this, your servant, to be a messenger of your word. So that, Lord, each and every one that is gathered here will hear the word from thee and become that doer of what you called us to do. We pray, O oh Father, in the name of Jesus, on this message that you have given us, that you are giving us, pray for the messenger that is to give the word, Lord, from thee. And we just ask for right now that you bless this congregation as we prepare to hear the word. Feed us, Lord. Feed us that we thirst and hunger no more. We ask this in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. And let everyone say Amen. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> okay. We'll be reading, if you read with me again, please, John 21, 15 through 17. When they finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third, on verse 17, it says, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. This morning, I want to talk about a touch on the subject, a touch or talk about the touch on the subject of love, something that we all need in our life. We all need love. So my sermon, my sermonic message this day, this morning, is what's love got to do with it? What's love got to do with it? You know, I've come to understand it is get difficult to talk about someone that you care about and not talk about loving what they do. We can't talk about a meaningful relationship without talking about loving something about that relationship. You can't talk about your blessings without loving the Lord who bestows his blessings upon you. And I say that this morning because so often we take credit for our own blessings. We own it. We claim responsibility for what was done. We believe whatever we earn, we earned that. We did that. We brought that house, that car. But I've come to tell you today, this morning, we didn't do it. God did it. Right now. For example, when we tie, it is God who blesses us with what we get. God blesses us because he loves us. God forgives us because he loves us. And when you talk about the Lord 
and how he's brought you through is because he loves you. You know it. And as Christians, we can't say or do anything without loving the Lord. Somebody ought to say amen this morning. So what's love got to do with it? Love is an action and that encompasses everything that we do. You do things out of love. And it's not just a word. It's not, as Tina Turner says, a secondhand emotion either. It is much more than that. We're living in a world where within the last two years, we've been unable to touch each other. We were unable to touch the people that we love, our grandmothers, our mothers, our sisters, our brothers, our husbands, our, all the people that truly we love. We've been unable, church, to touch. We couldn't attend church. We couldn't attend the church service corporately or any gathering. We could not fellowship or take communion. I remember Thanksgiving being different this last year. Many things changed. We learned to access modern technology to communicate even here at Bethlehem. Early in the morning, every day we communicate with the Lord, but here at Bethlehem, we communicated electronically. And church, we did learn. We learned from it. But the Lord continues to bless us. But the Lord blessed us first to love one another. You know why? Because God first loved us. Throughout scripture, we acquire many concepts of love. But in our scripture today, Jesus is calling our attention to a love that transcends above and beyond our understanding. It is a love of commitment. Each one of us has our own defining of what love is. If you ask someone to define love, the list could go on and on and on. A young child knows the feeling of love through a touch. As adults, the expressions of love are displayed in many shapes form and fashion. Love extends and reaches across many boundaries in life. We cannot live without love. We cannot be believers and serve God without love. Now the primary words used to express the concepts of love in the New Testament are agape and phileo. The word agape is used by believers to mean a special, unconditional love of God, a self-sacrificial love as used, a self-sacrificial love as when Jesus was crucified on the cross. And it's used interchangeable with phileo to designate God the Father's love for Jesus with tender affection like sister or brotherly love. You know, we love our sisters and our brothers. In our scripture, Jesus asked Peter three times, did he love him? Now, when you read this, you wonder if Jesus was not sure about Peter's love. And some have even gone so far as to associate this scripture of Peter with when he disowned Jesus three times. You remember. Some believed Jesus was giving him the opportunity to affirm his love. But I don't believe that today because the Lord knows our heart. The Lord knows my heart. And the living word says, I knew you when you were conceived in the secret place. So I believe Jesus was confirming Peter's love for the commitment of, of his ministry for Christ. Because if you recall earlier, Jesus said to all of the disciples to go out and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And when the Lord commands you to serve, that is his call upon your life. God called Moses to lead his chosen people. 
But we too have been called, sisters and brothers, with a commitment to serve one another. For the word says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. We are to labor in the commitment of love to serve one another. But while they were eating breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, do you agape, do you love me more than these? The question is asked, who was Jesus referring to when he said these? I believe Jesus was speaking of worldly values. Because sometimes we get caught up in our personal commitments. We become distracted by our commitment to serve God. Sometimes when the valley is low and the mountain too high, we become disengaged from the true word of God. The values of this world can lead you away from the love of God. Remember the rich ruler who was unable to give up his worldly possessions for eternal life? God's timing means everything to us. As Christians, although our worldly possessions require much attention, they're not as significant as the living word of God. You know, I often think about a friend I had who is deceased now, but this friend was addicted to the lottery. He had to play his lottery numbers by noon, Monday through Friday. And although that's not unusual, because people play the lottery, it's the significance that we attach to it that can distract our attention. Psalms 31, 15 says, my times are in your hand. Yes, yes we live in a world that requires timing, but as Jesus said to Peter, do you love me more than the world? Do you love me more than these? And if you answer yes, Lord, Jesus says, feed my sheep. We must recognize the significance of God's timing that is in his word. Now Jesus asked Simon again the second time, do you love me, Peter? And Peter answered, yes, Lord, you know I love you. I believe Jesus knew Peter loved him. Remember, Peter preached the sermon and converted 3,000 people at Pentecost. Jesus knows we love him. The writer of Hebrews 4.13 and the NIV tells us, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. I don't care what you do. I don't care how you do it. Jesus knows all things. He knows everything you do before you do it. What's love got to do with it? All things. All things. The Lord sees and knows, for he knows all things. It's one thing to say you love the Lord, but it's your actions that speak louder than words. Love strengthens our faith and fellowship with Christ and with one another. Love makes unbelievers believers. Jesus is commanding us, as he did to Peter, take care of my sheep. And we have many sheep in this world. This is what love has to do with it. We often define love as an authentic feeling toward one another, but God's love is everlasting because superficial love is here today and gone tomorrow. You ever buy something or purchase something that you really like and you, you turn around and the next day you don't know where it is, maybe there's a reason for it. It's superficial, it was not for you. Love is an action. Love moves, love suffers, love forgives. Jesus knew that Peter's commitment required the fruits of the Spirit. You know what they are. Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, but the greatest of all is love. You see, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. Have you ever been in love? Now, I asked you that, but I know all of us know. Yes, we've all been in love. And your heart, at some point in time, was broken. That's feeling. You can understand why Jesus died for our sins. Not just his life for our life, his love for our life. The word says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life 
for the life of a friend. The third time Jesus used the word love translates into the Greek word phileo, meaning a feeling of closeness for another person. Peter, Jesus asked, do you really love me? Are you really my friend? You know, many times as children or just friends, teenagers, we ask that question, do you really love me? Sometimes when you're just, your heart is throbbing for someone, do you really love me? Do you really like me? Are you my friend? In other words, are you willing to commit your life to feed and care for my sheep? And I say, or I said earlier, I say it again, there are many sheep in this world, and we all belong to the Lord. What would you say if someone asked you the question, that very question? What would you say if someone asked you that question? Jesus is asking you, do you love me? Do you really, really, really love me? What does love have to do with it? Love is the source of it all. Jesus said, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, care for my sheep. And as I said earlier, love is an action. Jesse Hamilton, a former house cook for 14 years at the Delta fraternity at LSU, was gifted with a blessing on her 74th birthday. This lady was working two jobs to make ends meet. The brothers of the fraternity paid off her hot mortgage. And she said later when she calmed herself down, when you love someone, you show them. And that's an action. Jesus loves us. Therefore, he paid that price at Calvary. And no action or love speaks louder than what he did. That is love. That is love. There is no greater love than this. Sisters and brothers, our actions should speak louder than our words. Because sometimes we say one thing, but we do another. Sometimes we say we love you, but sometimes we don't show that we love you. This is what Jesus is telling us to commit to. If he committed for each one of us. We must commit for one another. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians said, if I have the gift of prophecy, can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. What does love have to do with it, you ask? Love is our relationship with the Lord. Therefore, it is our relationship with one another. And somebody needs to say, Amen, Amen, Amen. Love is something that we grow into. When a mother gives birth to a child, all the nurturing and love goes into the bond between the mother and the child. Nothing, nothing can separate that love. That's the relationship that God has with us. Nothing can separate us. That's the relationship we desire to have him, to have with him as a body of Christian believers. Jesus said, care for my sheep. And we are his sheep. We know this. Paul received a direct revelation from Jesus to proclaim the good news about him about Jesus to the Gentiles. Remember Jonah, who was displeased when God spared the people of Nivea? He felt they were a wicked people that did not deserve life. Now we've got people right now today that we know that in our midst that feel that people, some people don't deserve what they've given. But God gives regardless of who you are. And you need to know today that it doesn't matter what you did yesterday. Doesn't matter what you might do. God still loves you. God still loves you. God exercised patience with Jonah, which is what, what we ourselves must exercise 
with each other. For love does not anger, nor is it self-seeking. And that's something that we have to grow and mature in. Because we are not perfect, but God is perfect. What's love got to do with it? Compassion is a requisite of love. Jesus shared the parable about the compassion of the Good Samaritan to show the greatness of love. A man was robbed and beaten, left for dead. You know the story. A priest and a Levite come along. Both were religious men. They hurried on past the wounded man. But along comes a Samaritan who was hated by the Jews and takes care of this wounded man's needs for recovery. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts and souls and your neighbor as yourself. Can you love the Lord and not your neighbor? Think about that. People live in areas where they don't care for their neighbor because the neighbor does things that the person or the people would not do. So they label them. How can you say you love the Lord when you don't love your neighbor? What's love got to do with it? Love is a key component of God's creation. Not just his authority over humanity, but his deep love for each one of us. What's love got to do with it? Love bears all things, endures all things. God's love is the greatest of all human qualities. God loves, God's love endures forever. Jesus paid the ultimate price for you and for me. That's love. He paid the price at Calvary to save a wrench like me. They hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head and died. That's love. Yeah. But that's not how the story ends. Because yeah. three days later, yeah. he rose again. That's love. Love is an attribute of God himself. John tells us in 4, 8, whoever does not love, does not know God, because God is love. So I cannot say I love you, but I don't care for you. I got to love you, because God loves you more than me. Love is the content of God's message that prepares us each day. When you woke us up this morning, that's love. <laughs> when we pray, we lift up. When we give, we receive. That's love. Faith is the attitude and love is the action. Everyone gathered here today is carrying some kind of a burden. We've been through a storm or we will be going through a storm. Look at your neighbor in the car or standing beside you and say, Jesus knows all about our struggles. God's love is an impetus, which means it is the stimulus, the driving force in achieving the unimaginable relationship to our God in all things. Not a few, but all things. Love is the force that saturates us for it and, and ensures that we extend the same to others. You know, I read an article uh, where the writer quoted an excerpt from the late Billy Graham. So let me share it with you. Because this is how it reads. God is good. When we preach atonement, it is atonement planned by love. When we preach the resurrection of Christ, we are preaching the miracle of love. When we preach the return of Christ, we are preaching the fulfillment of love. That's what love has got to do with the church. Yeah. That's what love has got to do with it. And I just ask right now that each and every one that's gathered here tell somebody, 
Go out and tell somebody about the goodness of the Lord. For we serve a mighty God who has brought us a mighty, mighty old way. A mighty old way. That's love. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you. We thank you that, Lord, your hand touched us this morning with love. We thank you, Lord, that you just touched us with health and with strength, even those who can't see, can't do, shut in, they're not closed out, Lord. We thank you that you placed your hand upon us. Now, Lord, we ask for this word that you've given us to touch someone, touch their heart, and Lord, let them know that we serve a mighty God who can never fail. So it is, Father, we pray. Open up our hearts and our souls and our minds that we might hear a word, have heard a word, and become a doer of the word. We ask, O oh Lord, your blessing this day, this day, Father God, as we give thanks. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Let us say amen. Uh, Reverend Ford to come and pray for our pastor and uh, just pray that he is okay. We pray for the family. We pray for our own as well because we know that you see the Lord belongs the Lord blesses all of us and that Pastor Davis belongs to us. I don't know a person that he's not touched in some special way. So we ask now, Reverend Ford, would you come forward? We need to be on one accord. So this is some things that I just want to mention so you'll know that as we go into this prayer, we're going to pray because God has already heard our prayer. God has already answered our prayer, but we're going to have to stand on faith. So we're going to have to be careful of the things we say out of our mouth. Yes. When we're talking about pastor, we're going to say, you know, we're not going to say what we think is going on with him. Oh, yeah. We're going to say that God's will is being done in his life. We're going to watch our mouth and our tongue because there's life and death in the tongue. So we're going to speak life over our pastor. We're going to speak healing to take place in his life in the name of Jesus. And we're going to stand on faith and watch God move. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Oh, bless your name, Lord God. Oh, Father God, we just thank you right now, Lord God. We thank you, Father God, because you promised in your word that before we call that you will answer. And while we're yet speaking, you will hear. Lord God, you already know what's on each and every one of our hearts, Father God. You know, Lord God, how we feel it right now in this moment. And we know, Father God, that you have already taken care of the situation. But because, Lord God, you told us to come to you, we're coming, Lord God. If we have any request of you, you said come. But first, we must believe that we have received it. Lord God, we come right now in the name of Jesus. We pray for our pastor, Dr. Davis, Lord God. Your child, Father God. Your man servant, Lord God. You know all about him, Father God. You know how he's doing at this moment, Lord God. You know what he needs, Father God. And you also know, Lord God, that if it's healing in his body, you are the healer. You still heal. You said in your word that by his strife, by your strife, we are healed. That's already done, Lord God. So we just claiming his healing right now in the name of Jesus. Father God, we pray, Father God, that as he lay on his bed, Lord God, of affliction, that it just won't be lying there, Lord God. But he receiving all those things that you will have for him to do when you raise him up, Father God. So right now we pray, Lord God, that he will hear and that he will receive, Father. That when he brings up, Lord God, that he will do your will according to your way, Lord God. 
that he would not deviate to the right or to the left, Lord God, but walk according to what you have told him to do, Lord God. And we're going to thank you right now, Lord God, for answering that prayer, Father God. We're going to thank you right now, Lord God, because you've given the strength that they need to his family, Father God. You know that, Lord God, that they may be worried right now, but if they call upon the name of the Lord, all they need to do is call upon you because you are our comforter. You are our strength, Lord God. You are our peace in the middle of the storm, Father God. All we have to do is have faith the size of a mustard seed. You promise in your word that if we have faith that size, we can speak to the mountain and the mountain must move, Lord God. Whether the mountain is sickness, Lord God, finances, Father God, weary, Lord God, whatever it is, we speak it right now in the name of Jesus. Mountain, move out of our way. In the name of Jesus, Father Lord. Oh, we bless your name, Father. We praise your name, Lord God. You're good and you're worthy, Lord God, of all praise. We thank you, Father God, for hearing and for answering prayers. So, Lord God, we just place him in your hands, Father God, that your will be done in his life and it be done according to your will, Lord God. And we're going to stand on your word and watch you work. These prayers and all prayers we ask in the precious and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As we prepare to end our service, just want to ask you a couple of things. Do you know the Lord? Do you know of his amazing love for you? Do you know there's no greater love for anyone than the one that he gave for each and every one of us? So as we open these doors to my father's house, I want you to reflect on the greatness of God. If you don't know him, now is the time to come. Just as you are. He'll make your life brand new. Yeah. He already knows who you are. All you have to do is come. Come. Give these deacons your hand. Give them your name, address, or just a contact. Come. God will do the rest. Doors of my father's house are open. Thank you.